Hey there, folks. Welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And all right, first new episode of 2021. Bizarrely, it feels like I've got a lot to say. This might be a long episode, but 2021 is actually starting off pretty slow with album releases, and I'm very much on top of my schedule. And I'm not about to complain about that, so let's get on the pulse. So we got nine albums on the docket. Let's first start off with from Yoasobi, the Pope. So this is an odd debut album from a pairing in J-pop that's a bit tough to describe. Vocaloid producer Ayes, who is not using Vocaloids, but instead the singer Akura, both of whom had some solo groundswell before they teamed up here and saw a lot of success with their initial run of singles the past couple of years. Now, I was aware of them courtesy of my song reviews on IGTV, at Spectrum Pulse, it's your loss if you're not watching, and thus, I was mostly curious to cover a pretty short debut album, and I gotta be honest, well, it's certainly got a lot of the lush prettiness that contributes to a very likable and very well-balanced J-pop album, with some detours into city pop with hints of modern, rickety trap percussion. I'm not really sure this really rises above that, because Yoasobi is known for self-contained narratives within their previous singles and music videos, and that somewhat translates to the writing here, with the album loosely structured as reading the titular book backwards, and the album that's kind of intriguing with they play with some of that temporal element in relationships, be it coming on reflecting upon the past, or potentially knowing the expected future. Or really, how much can we know outside of a very specific moment and instance in time, especially when it comes to love? And that even leaps into a song here, where the protagonist is trying to be super upbeat and save their partner from killing themselves? Which is certainly delivered with a way more cutesy energy than I would expect. Very kawaii and not how I would particularly have framed it. Hell, that might be the root of my problem with this album. It's got a lot of that jaunty bounce that's primed for so many romantic anime theme songs, but through over the course of an entire project, without a lot of modulation, it can start feeling kind of one note. No matter how much they will jump into a bunch of key changes or throw along some surprisingly tight bass lines. And you know what? That does make sense for an album that's all about seizing those moments of love and passion, but when you smash all those high-energy moments together and string them along, this starts feeling a little bit airless and kind of exhausting. So, light 6 out of 10. I feel like folks who can really vibe with this aesthetic will appreciate this a lot more than I do, and I do think conceptually it's pretty interesting, just not all the way my thing. That's all. Next up from Viagra Boys, Welfare Jazz. <laughs> You know, with that name, you feel like you're setting yourself up for a joke act, when in reality, you might be getting something a little more questionable. Now, this is a Swedish post-punk band, with members pulled from a couple other notable acts in their scene, and they're trying to split the difference between a lot of bellicose humor and some pointed social commentary. I went back to hear their debut, I, I thought it was okay, but going into this sophomore follow-up, look, I gotta be blunt here, this kind of became a chore to listen through every time I went back to it. Now, part of this is that the group is doing the whole ironic macho asshole thing that you'd hear from an artist like Alex Cameron, but with a mix of the howling hardcore delivery and chunky grooves you'd hear from Idols or, hell, late 80s Nick Cave from when he was shifting from post-punk to a lot of the vintage goth rock. Now, look, I am a sort of guy who tends to like this sort of subversion, and I like a lot of the aesthetic I described. I praised artists like Alex Cameron, and Kieran J. Callanan for hitting that sweet spot, but they often got there by being deceptively sharp songwriters who could marshal great hooks along the way. Whereas, between some of the gargled vocal pickups, the really cruddy drum mixing, the shambling bass lines, and just how often the synths and the horns will fart across the mix here, and frankly, given the tempo and all these horns, I'm surprised more folks aren't making a bit of a ska connection along with the wonky 80s dance pivots that are a little Talking Heads derivative. Frankly, it reminds me of a brand of post-punk art rock that's trying way too hard to make a point with some unflattering ugliness. 
and then kind of succeeding in spite of itself. Because you know what, if I felt this came out to more, that would be one thing. But the arc of the album feels a little warped, with said toxic macho asshole winding up alone of his own free will, he left this girl, but then he figures out he wants to be with her again. And the album ends with a squonky John Prine cover that highlights just how strange and quirky they are, but they're making it work. And that's a bizarrely chipper ending after To The Country, where it seems like there's a lot of willful denial going on about how far he's come and how much any of this is gonna last, and how there's been very little real change. But you know what, Make it. maybe I'm taking all this way too seriously, because everyone here, especially the dumbass protagonist with this preening and posturing on cuts like I Feel Alive, Maybe they're caricatures on purpose, which given some of the absurd animal metaphors, that would be a sensible interpretation. But it's still not really all that refined or witty or even all that funny to play into it, especially with that revealing nihilism of undercurrent that ran through girls and boys. Honestly, when the album just gets out of its own way for where the post-punk becomes a lot more straightforward or hard scrabble or even more danceable, leaning on the textured grooves like on Creature or Six Shooter outside of that very wonky sample that's shoved in for a breakdown. I'll at least say it's a little bit more likable. I see the appeal, but otherwise, this is an album that feels like it was trying to be a parody, wound up a half measure, missed the point to drill deeper, and ultimately I didn't find it all that fun at all. It's got enough okay moments that I'm giving it a 5 out of 10, but by the end, I just want another Alex Cameron album. The sooner we get on that, the better. Next up, from Despondent Moon, Enshrouded in Internal Moon. <laughs> Okay, this one is less driven off of my Bandcamp deep diving, and more off the fact that I've seen Mike Seatown recommend this blend of raw black metal and dungeon synth, which is an offshoot of ambient synth music originating somewhat in the late 80s and early 90s, that in recent years has seen a bit of a popular revival. Now, Despondent Moon is actually the black metal side project of dungeon synth producer Diorc Way. Kind of ironic that his black metal material has attracted a fair bit more attention, and this is his third project with this sound. And... Okay, the disclaimer that I couldn't make heads or tails of any of the vocals on this album given how suffocated they feel within the mix, I would probably say this is Despondent Moon's most elaborately arranged and yet frenetic and most furious album to date. The keys have picked up some hints of symphonic swell, the blast beats hit with a lot more impact, and a lot of the tremolo riffs will just crash across the mix with even more furious abandon. And you know what, while that does make for one hell of a visceral texture, and it desperately makes me wish for live shows that could recreate this sort of pummeling, suffocating vibe. It really does remind me of a lot of them. It's kind of hard to ignore that there isn't that much contrast within the black metal focus cuts, and that this production can really smother strong melodies or a truly aggressive low-end groove. Now, there are songs like Apparition of the Countess Descending the Spiral Staircase that can channel and focus some of that chaotic nightmare a little bit more effectively. And you know what? I dug how Visions of Candlelit Exhumation, it was there to balance itself midway through. But you know what? Outside of the more melodic dungeon synth moments, which were some nice contrast, this album's most frustrating element might be some of its own consistency. And that I just couldn't find a lot of those moments that really leapt off the page and stood out for me. It's really damn solid. It's getting a light 7 out of 10 as a result. And I can imagine folks who really really vibe with either raw black metal or dungeon synth will just love this, but for me, I don't know, not quite there yet. Next up from Hospital Bracelet, South Loop Okay, so this is the debut full-length album from a Chicago emo act with a lead singer who fits somewhere between the 90s revival artists like Soccer Mommy and Vagabond, and the more immediately striking, dare I even say pop delivery of a Jetty Bones, where the guitars have a sharper, rattling tone off the sinuous bass lines, and a compositional structure that probably owes a little bit more to post-hardcore than anything else. Help just how often the lead vocal line will bend the meter and slide in off-rhythm, 
adds in some fractured intensity to a lot of these pieces. Now, unfortunately, some of that 90s emo influence means the vocals are shoved a little deeper than they should be into the mix, where they're fighting to bounce off the sparking fuzz of the lead guitar and a lot of those cymbals. And you know what? It might make sense given how much the album is isolated and yearning without fully exploding or being fully realized. But a lot of the writing here is sharp and incisive enough that I frankly wouldn't have minded more focus on it in the mix, especially when they really start tearing into people who will use and exploit others or have the privilege to treat everyone as disposable or expendable for a season. And one dimension I really appreciate about the storytelling here is that a lot of the escape they might need is compounded by not really having the money in order to enable it or not being good enough with the money and they just get reckless, which only intensifies the fractured pain of an abusive relationship across the midsection of the project and the rather heartbreaking conclusion where even if you find a season of release, it's going to fade even if you bought in more deeply to those connections. And yet when placed in contrast, the excited, extended D&D &D metaphor of seeking love on sour OG RPG, it accentuates a lot of the homegrown charm of this framing, and it becomes an emotional roller coaster that's detailed and relatable enough to really pull you in. So in short, it did take a bit to really sink into this album, but I think it's the first legit great project of 2021. Light 8 out of 10, highly recommend it. Next up from Pearl Charles, Magic Alright, so fun story. I actually found this artist randomly on Bandcamp. I really liked her sweet vocals balanced against some alternative country that flirted with some dreamier tones in the song that I had heard. So I put her on my list to cover in the near future if I had some time. And then a friend of mine started raving about the album and that convinced me we could really have something special here. So I checked out her debut EP and her first album and they were pleasant enough. The compositions and the writing were pretty good. The production didn't really do much to elevate them, but okay, how is the sophomore album, this project here? Well, you know what? If anything, it reminds me of that country politan sound that slid towards some campier, poppier tones in the mid to late 70s, maybe with some touches of soft rock around the way. And once you slip into that vibe, it is indeed very well produced and arranged to pull off that retro feel, better than a lot of stuff I've heard trying to do this sound, almost to the point it could feel a little bit like a throwback, with the supple bass lines, the gentle analog keyboards and the guitars, a lot of the blissed out tones that are becoming increasingly popular, and given the other retro rock stylings that Pearl Charles has gone after, has me wondering whether or not she's trend chasing a little bit going here, but I bring that up because once you've emerged yourself in that atmosphere and you're looking to dig for more, well, there's not really that much more to go with, or at least that might seem to be a case. Dig even a little bit deeper and you notice just how much the album surrounds itself in misty deflection and glamour in every sense of the word, where even our protagonist might get a little bit lost in knowing who she really is amidst a lot of listless loneliness, either in her relationships or in her art. And you know what? That that's an interesting and rather subtle art for a dreamy album like this until the second half, where it slips pretty damn close to a lot of love-struck hippie platitudes, where the final song is damn near apocalyptic in its framing, and I'm half reminded of the ending of Lana Del Rey's Lust for Life. And you know what, if it's trying to be escapist in the face of the end of the world, I, I mean, fine, I get it, we need that time, but it leaves the album feeling a little bit more shallow than I was hoping, even if the overall tone and sound was plenty agreeable. If you've got a fondness for some of the most chintzy parts of the set, 70s, and I do, it's a solid enough pastiche, albeit not much more, so very light 7 out of 10, ah, oh, what the hell, give it a shot. Next up, from Rap Ferreira, Bob's son, Rap Ferreira in the Garden Level Cafe of the Scallops Hotel. New crown, new crown, new slurs, new verbs, new curves, new nouns, new sounds, new pounds, new rounds, new pounds. Alright, arguably the first album released in 2020, one that had a bit of hype already built in for me, given how much I love the moody introspection and density of Purple Moonlight Pages, I had expectations for this, 
and that was probably not for the best, because this is Rap Ferreira at one of his most deflective and abstract projects to date. And as such, it kind of becomes tough to analyze. The Bob in question is referring to the beatnik, surrealist, and jazz poet Bob Kaufman, who lived one hell of a fascinating and hard scrabble life, and where I can absolutely see why Rap Ferreira might find a bit of a kinship with him, especially in his impressionistic style and downbeat bleakness that really creeps in between the lines. And thus, like Purple Moonlight Pages, this album builds on more existential questions of what drives the creation of that sort of surreal, borderline anarchistic poetry and the observational and confrontational role that jazz poetry and later rap has created in society. And the answer... well, deflective is once again the ideal word. Because Rap Ferreira is not particularly interested in explaining the roots of his art, or even whether it's in the long-term answer to any question. And the tension between that self-restraint and yet feeling compelled to deliver anyway, that is the closest thing to an answer we're gonna get. And then the power captured in those words and hitting that unique vulnerability to expose his experience, or even simply hit the balance of peace of mind. It's a nice little callback of who told you to think. You know what? I will say that is something that he prizes very deeply and it gives us a bit of an emotional core. He would never demean himself with definition, which is why the playfully cool hedonism of a bombiness manifesto it actually works pretty well in capturing that thematic arc. And I really wish I felt like I hadn't seen this arc from him multiple times before. I can point to 2018's budding ornithologist. It's really a close parallel to this album. But circling a lot of self-justification, this is territory he has been around before. For. And you know, for as postmodern as he likes to be, this is an album that loves to sidestep hierarchies until he can place himself on the top of one. And the self-awareness does not go that far to call himself out. It also feels weirdly airless here, and given that he produced the entire project under his Scallops Hotel alias, it absolutely has the feel of writing a concept into a corner with a lot of the hooks, the song structure, and even consistent mix quality be damned. As such, the compositions feel way more free-flowing and fragmented, and there are fewer striking moments of revelation or transcendent wordplay or brilliant production, if I'm being honest. I mean, it's certainly textured and the poetry samples are genuinely compelling. I like the interviews, but I wish they added up to a little bit more. And look, I'm a sucker for art about making art, and this brand of postmodernism has a reputation of working for me, but the Ouroboros in the Hall of Self-Justified Mirrors is starting to starve out a little bit. That's all I'm saying. Solid 7 out of 10, pretty good stuff, will not be for everyone even in that abstract lane, but it will keep you curious. Give it a chance. Next up from Jasmine Sullivan, Hotel. Talking about Jasmine Sullivan can be kind of complicated, mostly because she feels like an artist that I want to like a lot more than I do. She reminds me a lot of Kay Michelle in her huge raw vocals, obvious influence of R&B of the past, songwriting that plays comfortably in messy melodrama without a lot of subtlety, and questionable production and compositions that rarely highlight a unique sound that she can make her own. Now, I've listened to her previous three albums, they're fine, but especially in the production, I've struggled to find a lot of elements that best complement or elevate her delivery or stand out from the pack. And now with this EP, well, you know what, for a self-contained experiment where Jasmine Sullivan and her collaborators muse through various relationships and the throes of passion are going awry, where some songs are leaning heavily on indulgent power fantasy or a reclamation of power, and others are a little bit more vulnerable and introspective, I'll say it's probably one of her most consistent works to date, at least in terms of writing and a lot of the themes, and I like that the project takes a wider angle to these scenes and avoids a lot of moralistic framing about sex or relationships. Outside of recognizing one's self and one's own worth, it gives our feminine protagonists a lot of moments of triumph, but also where their sexual appetites might have compromised relationships, or where their bad decisions are more complicated to explore and you can't exactly judge them in a straightforward way. That said, 
Of course this album's not for me, or even the sex songs are less about satisfying the audience and more about these black women finding their own ecstasy. And that's fine enough, on the sex jams they still sound pretty damn good. But then you get price tags, and the other side, and the whole materialistic tricking thing, it just does not appeal to me whatsoever. Even with Anderson Pack, who is gamely playing along, it's tying into a lot of the commodification of romance and sex that is present in a lot of scenes and cultures, I get its reality, I even get the appeal, but I'm not sure it goes beyond indulgence in ways that other moments here do. I've got some other quibbles. I still think Jasmine Sullivan can be a very unsubtle singer who can overplay some quieter moments more than she should, but I sure as hell like her raw tones in comparison with a few moments they try to slip in some auto-tune or some very questionable vocal production with some of the trap elements. And you know what? While we are talking about production, it is certainly more consistent, especially in its quality, but Jasmine Sullivan has always struggled to find a unique tone in R&B or soul to really support her compositions, make them her own unique identity. And between the trap and acoustic tones, I'm not hearing what makes these uniquely hers, especially when I'd argue that her and Ari Lennox, they project more vibes that are uniquely theirs on this album. Look, it's getting a lot of early acclaim in 2021. I get why. It's probably Jasmine Sullivan's most distinct and refined word to date. And even with that, I appreciate that she wants to call this a little bit more of an EP, more a self-indulgent lark that's just fine for her. But it feels a little thin. And even if it's not for me, there is art in this lane from acts like Jeanne Aiko that execute this sort of euphoric drama with a bit more resonance. So, very light 7 out of 10. Again, I think it's pretty damn good, but I wanted to like it more. Maybe even being a bit generous here too. That's all I'm saying. Next up from Ashniko Demi. I don't want you do what you want, but just do it. Cause I'm so over you. Okay. This has been on my radar since at some point last year when Demi Devil got added to my schedule, but then the tape got pushed back to the beginning of this year, where it became my first real exposure to her sound. And how to best describe it? Okay, imagine Rico Nasty, but with stylism rooted less in manic hyperpop and more in 2000s pop rock, R&B worship, and a warped brand of cherry tree plastic theatricality. And you know, given that I grew up in the 2000s, it is distinctly uncanny to watch what sounds have persisted and proven influential across this album in particular, which is the nice way of me saying that opposite all the cheap sounding trap beats, some of the oily and squonky synth choices can test my patience pretty damn quickly, especially as Ashniko isn't quite as dynamic or striking in her delivery in comparison with Rico Nasty or the increasing number of women who are using this technicolor approach. And like with Nightmare Vacation, I'm gonna say it, the least interesting songs are the party cuts. Now, there's also a massive influx of some bratty feminist energy to this project that more often than not can be pretty damn funny when she gets more creative in some of the punishments she will mete out to a lot of hapless idiot guys around her who want to project upon her art. I'm a theater guy at heart, and I thought Clitoris the Musical, that was just great, especially to end off the album. And songs like Little Boy, Cry, and Good While It Lasted, touching a lot of the roots of her anger, there's more complexity here, but yet it's not cutting more deeply for me, and I'm not quite sure why. I thought part of it is because she doesn't really convey a lot of intensity with her vocals, which can't help but sound very young, which is a little bit weird, given given that she's 24 and sounds a decade younger. But you know what, this is pop. It doesn't have to go super hard as long as it's fun and colorful. And while some of these mixes have some of that color, the tape can't help but feel a little bit underproduced in cultivating any sort of atmosphere, especially when we get the trap flip of Avril Lavigne's Skater Boy. I mean, no issues with the updated content, but you gutted the guitar line to do it, come on. I don't know, this is a project where the presentation clearly wants to come across as more home grown and scrappy, especially with the underproduced trap elements and a lot of the attitude, but the obvious expenditure in a lot of the samples and the lack of overall edge in the sound feels like we're getting a safer project than she might have intended with some of the content here. And yes, I am fully aware that Avril Lavigne got a lot of similar unfair criticisms of her debut album, but you know what? I gotta say it, I lived back then. Avril, she had the tunes, she could sell it a little better. Ashnika? 
know, at least for me, she's just not there yet. Light 6 out of 10, a lot of potential, a lot of funny and distinctive moments. I just want to hear more. And finally, from Why Don't We, The Good Times and The Bad Ones. time we're getting another boy band revival i feel like we're not that far removed from the last one but e-boys are in all in on that hair well okay anyway why don't we is actually an american group that broke out in the past three or four years with their debut album in 2018 and i completely understand why it did not make any waves back then as even if the boys had okay vocal chemistry reminiscent of a late period in sync they were really let down by some weak writing and pretty shoddy production that didn't give them much in the way of good tunes in order to work with. I heard this album was a little bit more interesting, mostly self-contained and produced by the band, and to some extent it is, but if Why Don't We was intending to use this project to define a unique sound for themselves, there are a lot of choices that strike me as complete misfires, even if overall I think this is more distinctive and probably more memorable and arguably an improvement. The problem is that said distinctiveness comes through comparisons to other acts. Maybe not the best idea to have the first two songs on your pretty short album sample Black Skinhead and then 1979 by the Smashing Pumpkins respectively, which are some very recognizable moments that Why Don't We can't elevate or recontextualize to match or surpass the originals. But honestly, it kind of goes deeper than that. I was astounded to discover how much the group tried to keep the writing and production in-house, because there are multiple moments that feel like the group is trying to make Bozzy songs or Post Malone songs circa Hollywood's bleeding with a pop trap boy band twist from a lot of their vocal cadences to especially their rhythm section. And that really doesn't help a group develop its own members' unique voices or their own presence. Help, Skrillex shows up to produce For You, and I'll say it, his production is more distinctive than anything that these guys actually deliver. And look, I'm fully aware that I've gone through multiple boy band eras at this point, I'm 30, and it's probably not that fair to compare these guys to their forebears. But I'm not hearing a ton of vocal differentiation that you'd even get from the better contemporaneous K-pop boy bands, outside of Daniel Seavey's wheezy tones that I didn't like. But it's not like they're doing anything to make the content stand out here either. A lot of love songs, breakup songs, questions of anxiety that of course can be soothed with the right sort of companionship, a few raunchier moments that I'm frankly a bit surprised they got away with and that they really can't sell, especially Look At Me, which opens up with a sample of the Joker from The Dark Knight, which is deeply awkward and questionable in context with that song, but let's be real, none of this rises above the best in their genre. Yes, I am happy to hear the occasional bit of vocal harmonization creep back in, and I'm sure to their younger audience who doesn't know more, this'll play well. But as someone who has heard a lot of the best that this genre has had to offer, the most distinctive moments here are sampled from other places. Ergo, it's a 5 out of 10. Gotta say it, I've heard much better. But yeah, thanks a lot for watching. If you'd like to like and subscribe, I'd be more than grateful. I'm sure I said several controversial things. Have fun in the comments down below. But beyond that, anything else I may be able to do to improve my presentation, I'm all ears. And if you guys want to get involved in my scheduling process to get an album on my schedule, link to my Patreon is right over there. Keep in mind, you do not have to do so at this time. It's tough times out there for everybody. Feel no obligation. But if you want to get on, help get albums on my schedule, or hell, maybe even hop into my Discord server, the option is available. But until then, I'm Mark, you're watching On The Pulse on Spectrum Pulse, and I'll see you next time.